Part of it's like knitting, and part of it's like painting the Sistine Chapel. You've got to find excitement and desire to get both of them as good as they can be. This is the Creative Voyage Podcast, a long-form interview show with the mission to help creative professionals to level up. I'm your host, Mario De Picolzuane. I'm a creative professional myself, active in the fields of graphic design, art direction, and creative consulting. In this podcast, I present in-depth interviews with some of the world's most inspiring creative professionals, revealing the stories that shape their lives and careers, plus actionable strategies to help you take your mindset and skills to the next level. I invite you to join me on this journey. In this episode, I talk to a creative director and designer. My name is Tony Brook. I'm um, a founding partner of um, SPIN, which is a, a graphic design studio based in London. Tony Brook is the co-founder and creative director of a British design studio, SPIN, and an independent publishing venture, Unit Editions. Founded in 1992, SPIN's small but extremely dedicated team, with Tony as a creative director, has received both national and international recognition. They've worked with clients that include Apple, Tate Modern, BBC, Nike, Design Museum, Google, Channel 4, Whitechapel Gallery, and Ministry of Sound, to name a few. In a feature about spin on Lectures in Progress, Will Hudson writes, quote, Over the last 20 years, Spin have firmly established themselves as one of the London's best design studios, delivering consistently high-quality work across a huge range of clients that span the arts, communication, broadcast, design, electronics, and entertainment sectors, as well as application. Their portfolio includes identities, books, marketing campaigns, motion graphics, packaging, and websites. End quote. In 2009, Tony co-founded Unit Editions, an independent publishing company. In 2011, he was a guest curator of Wim Crowell, a graphic odyssey, a major retrospective at the Design Museum in London. Also, he's a member of the prestigious Allianz Graphique Internationale, lectures regularly, and is known as an avid collector of graphic design printed matter. In this episode, we're going to listen to the highlights of the conversation I had with Tony in June 2019. We cover topics such as independent publishing, lessons he learned early in his career, Spin's organization as a design studio, their process for designing visual identity systems, and much more. As a kid, Tony was drawn to Egyptian hieroglyphs and Greek art. As a teenager, he was utterly obsessed by Leonardo da Vinci and then in turn by Pablo Picasso. He saw being creative throughout an entire life as they did as the ultimate goal. Record sleeves were always of his interest as well, especially punk and post-punk graphics. Like most of us, young Tony had creative tendencies, which is nothing unusual. However, he was led by those inclinations toward his profession. I'm often curious about that inflection point in someone's journey, the transition from an amateur to a professional. I began my conversation with Tony, asking him about that point in his journey and the early lessons he learned at the time. I had a very simple ambition, and that was to be paid to do a piece of design that I could be good enough for someone to think it worthwhile to pay me money to design something. That was my feeling all the way through college. That was my ambition. Now, there will be these design competitions and uh, there will be other things I knew about, DNAD and other competitions. And that was all very laudable and fine. And I remember hearing about the Alliance Graphic International, uh, which is an elite club of designers. And I remember thinking, wow, it would be amazing to be part of that. And then laughing at myself at the ludicrous idea that I could ever be part of that which I now am, but the idea of making something that someone would think it worthwhile and that had enough worth to be paid for was very, very important for me. Mm -hmm. It was a real ambition. So when my first job, I called up a a guy who basically said he would would be happy to see my portfolio. Mm -hmm. And if you picture the case, they're on the fourth floor and I'm dragging my massive portfolio up the stairs and then and then and I get to the top of the stairs and this guy pushed out through this door that I was just about to make for. He pushed past me 
stormed out and he just resigned his position. Mm -hmm. And then I came in, walked in and showed my portfolio. And a week later, they took me on for a week, for just one week. And uh, I got paid £90 for that week. And that was my ambition, fulfilled. Yeah. I'd, I'd been a professional designer for a week. And uh, someone paid me money to turn up and make some design. So then, I mean, I stayed at that place for seven years <laughs> after, after them taking me on for one week. And... I think that the reason they took me on for so long was because I would get in early, I would go home late, I would make the tea, I would do anything that was required. Nothing was too small a task. And the funny thing is, is that graphic design is a very narrow industry in terms of hierarchy. You are either doing menial tasks because they need doing, or potentially highly creative things because they need doing. Yeah. But that's about it. And you've got to get used to doing both. And you've got to find satisfaction in both and the best that there is in both. I mean, doing captions for a 500-page document or coming up with a creative solution for a, an international event or company or an identity which is going to last for 10 or 20 years. The, the thing is, they all require the same passion. And it's like part of it's like knitting. And part of it's like painting the Sistine Chapel. You've got to find excitement and the desire to get both of them as good as they can be. So yeah, it's a funny question like that. So how old were you at the time? 21. In the hindsight, when you look back, is there like something you kind of, you wished, you know, or like wish you could like advise yourself? Yeah. I stayed too long in the place that I was at because I was so grateful to get a job. I was, I was unemployed for two years. That's a long time. And I, and it was not very pleasant it was pretty grim okay so i wish that i'd have had more confidence in myself and that i push it because that, that was a, a kind of a, a side road in which i learned how to be a professional designer and i start feeling my worth and that i was worth something but it took a long time i took a long detour before i got back into where i felt I needed to be because I, I had a fairly strong opinion about what I wanted to do, but I wasn't able to do it in this place. Even though I was doing record sleeves and stuff, I wasn't able to do the kind of design that I wanted to do. I remember the first time they gave me anything to design, I did a record sleeve and it was incredibly minimal and pure and I was so pleased with it. And I showed it to the guy and he said, what's that? <laughs> so, <laughs> that's nothing you know why have you done that and so rather than lose my job i compromised pretty quickly and okay so <laughs> it was a, a long detour before i started actually listening to my the voice inside my head and became more confident about expressing my ideas on design which funnily enough i look back now i didn't know it at the time but i look back now and realize we're already there that my love of ideas, of color, of form, of experimenting, of open-mindedness as far as, as the possibilities for, for graphic expression were concerned, were all there. They were all pretty much there from the age of about seven onwards when I used to collect stamps and I would organize them aesthetically. They weren't organized by worth in terms of money, they were organized in terms of beauty. So I'd already got a very strong innate idea of what I thought was beautiful and what I thought was worth pouring over and looking at what wasn't. Yeah, yeah, I think that's fascinating. That's like very early on. Yeah, probably it's the same for all of us. I mean, we, we often don't have something to measure that by. But if you look into your past, look at the record sleeves that you might have bought as a kid and the ones that you really liked, the ones that you remembered the most, or the books that you might have looked at and the ones that you really treasured. And quite often the visuals are mixed in with the whole story and your affection for them as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think it is, yeah, for most people, it is like that. But it's kind of like hard to get back to that place. Yeah, it is. As we start being professionals, it's just kind of trying to make a living and trying to step into the professional world. Yeah. I guess also often I think maybe people don't perceive there's no like value in that. It's just like, oh, it's just like I was a kid and I like these three things. Yeah, I can see that. But there are some things, like I hadn't thought about it until my father found this stamp album that I had in his, in his loft and gave it to me and suddenly it all came back. And then I started looking at other things that I'd created 
And it seems insane that I was so tortured about becoming a designer because I was reasonably good at drawing. So I was thinking I was going to be an illustrator, but that just didn't do it. So I collected stamps. I collected beer mats. I started collecting seven inch singles because I could afford them basically in my pocket money for seven inch singles. But quite often I would buy them based on their covers because they couldn't, they weren't on the radio quite a lot of them. So I was a guest going down to the record shop. It was just like, it was anybody's guess what I was buying. So I would just buy the things that I thought looked cool. So before I made the decision to be a designer, I'd already been collecting graphic design like 10 years before I had to make the, and I didn't even know what graphic design was. Yeah. And when I was first introduced to it, my mum, I was looking to go to college and art college was a natural place for me to go. I wasn't really interested in anything much other than that. And she said, what about commercial art? And then it's like, what is that? She explained to me that I had a choice. I could either be a, a starving artist or I could possibly earn a living as a commercial artist. Yeah. I thought, I thought you know, it doesn't sound too bad. Uh, <laughs> so that set me off in that direction. But then I still was at this little tortuous route of being wanting to be an illustrator and then wanting to be a photographer. And then working out that one was to be an illustrator, I think your work needs to be full of your own personality and expression and well you know it didn't really sit with me and the idea of somebody telling me what they wanted me to draw and it was a similar thing with photography was that I loved photography I still do as a subject and I got huge respect for people who are good photographers and great photographers but I saw that as if I see anything as my art as my a bit of me that makes art it would be when I take photographs I'd see that as being an artistic endeavor. And that when I'm working as a designer, I see that as being professional. I think there's, there's art in design, for sure, art in graphic design, and art and craft in it. So it's not I don't see it any less. I don't see it in any lesser light, and quite often in greater. But yeah. I just see it in a slightly different way. I'm trying to come up with an inventive, invigorating, fresh solution for something. For me, it's really important that people connect with what we do and what we're making. I, I hate the idea of doing um, an invitation for a party for someone and nobody turning up. <laughs> I, I want effect. I don't, you know, I don't just, want, I just yeah. want to make a nice piece of design and everybody ignores it. The transition to professionalism can be an overwhelming task as almost anyone who tried to get a summer internship or land that first proper job can attest to. The creative market is exceptionally competitive and somewhat volatile, and a good portion of higher education fails in equipping the young talent with essential skills for that transition. At the same time, many young professionals do not make it easier for themselves, with a myriad of rookie mistakes and a lack of attention to detail. Tony is a seasoned professional with over 30 years of experience, so I've asked him for his perspective and advice for those who are starting their creative careers. People sending CVs with stupid spelling mistakes drives me insane, I would say. <laughs> Just go with me for a second on this. You're a designer, a young designer, you're sending your precious work that you put your heart and soul into in an email to a designer, and you've made two or three absolutely stupid mistakes you know, spelling mistakes. There's no excuse for it. And if you're going to do that in that situation, then you are absolutely bound to make those mistakes later on. And I found that recently with um, a young designer who we had as a placement student who I thought that if I discussed it with them before they did their placement, that they wouldn't make those mistakes. But they found three different ways of spelling Sheffield. <laughs> I can't go into it too much, but they made some silly mistakes. And there's something that I call the paranoid gene, where you feel physically ill at the idea of making a stupid mistake. <laughs> and it keeps you awake at night and you think, did I get that right? Is that correct? Is that Now, I think that designers, especially graphic designers and people who are working with typography and words need to have an element of that paranoid gene, that concern for getting it right. Yeah. I mean, I, I occasionally get like a, just like an email from a student who is maybe asking for an internship and I don't get it like 
that often, but it's surprising how often there's just like a lack of care or attention to detail. Well, they're throwing it out into the ether without realizing that there's a person on the end of it. I mean, if someone says to whom it may concern at the top of their, their letter, say what? <laughs> You're sending it to me. So one of the profound advantages of being a young designer today is that you can send a PDF or a URL in an email and it will land on the desk of the person that you want to talk to or that you, you want to be in front of. Yeah. Now, I'm old enough to remember before emails and you never got to see anybody. And now I defy any, anybody. If you send a PDF or a, a link to someone, they will look at it, right? They can't help it. You've got to open it. You've got to see what it is. So, and you, your work is shown on these beautiful screens, you know, and it's going to look the best it's ever going to look. So just take a little care, be professional about it. There was one student recently who I would have definitely taken on, on an internship, but had got four epically bad spelling mistakes in their work and in their letter and in their, yeah. just close your eyes for a moment and think how bad that looks. There's also another thing, which is curation. If you imagine that someone sends you a mail and their AMZ sends you a mail and 80% of their work is very good and you think it's fantastic and 20% sucks mm -hmm. and is really bad. Now, so the optimist would say, well, if they do the best work they can, this is going to be quite something. Yeah. But then your pessimist comes in and says, yeah, but what if it's 20%? What if that's their level, but they've been helped with the other expert? So yeah. I suppose it's a little bit of self-criticism and self-awareness goes a long way. Yeah. Do you have any other advice for like young people who are entering into graphic design professionally? Well, it's a tough industry. And I think a lot of people have been coming into it, certainly in the UK, have been coming into it thinking it was an easy option and it isn't anymore. I think I've got a huge amount of time for people coming out of college now because they've got to be self-motivated to a large degree. Mm -hmm. They've got to learn all the programs and it's very difficult. It's very complex. So when you see a student coming through, like you were talking about earlier about being creative and longevity and what have you, being a creative professional. Well, if you're coming out of college now, you've got to have some professional skills. You've got to have some ability to contribute to a studio. And the best kind of skills that you can have are motion skills and online skills. So there are some fantastic students, and we see them reasonably often, who've taken on those challenges while they've been at college, the challenge of learning how to make things move, the challenge of learning about how to get things into a website or whatever. Yeah. Still see an awful lot of them who just wish that that wasn't the case and wish that they were born 20 years earlier and that we were still doing silk screen posters all the time, which was never the case anyway. And <laughs> if your skill is limited to doing just print, then you really are, you're going to struggle, really. Mm -hmm. Because nearly all the work that's created now, all the design work that's created now, ends up on multiple platforms. Yeah, exactly. And you have to be ready for that. I don't know that necessarily that the universities or the, the lecturers are quite up to speed on what's happening technically, but it's a big advantage to the students if they are. Yeah. And there does seem to be this kind of like nostalgia about like back in the days, it was all, I guess, like fun or tactile or there's like a bigger value in creating a poster than a website. Yeah, that's right. I remember when I saw my first website and it looked like some bizarre Lord of the Rings kind of Hobbit thing. It was just <laughs> disgusting. I could see that it had obviously been designed by a programmer who had no graphic sensibility at all. And I thought, my God, this is the future. We'd better get on it because it's going to be <laughs> yeah. And that's proven to be the case. It's funny because we're now, SPIN now is exploring a lot more. In nearly every, all the projects that we do, there's some element of this, of exploring the combination of the digital and the analog. Mm -hmm. About a year ago, we moved into a space which uh, we now occupy, which is 
basically a purpose-built studio at the bottom of my garden. Okay. And we did that for one very specific reason. We wanted to encourage more experimentation offline in the real world yeah. and, um, and bring that into the computer and then work with that material. And we've done that. And it's very interesting how it manifests itself and how you stretch yourself creatively by physically making things and then taking them into and I'm fascinated into the computer. I'm fascinated by how these things behave next to each other and the contrasts and the dissonance between the two things. It's a really um, interesting thing conceptually and aesthetically. Yeah. But everything ends up being digital. Even if you make your stream poster, it still has to go through a digital process. So the idea that students are still wandering around thinking that they can do some sort of ye olde letterpress thing all their life. It's just not the case. It's just not real. And I feel for them in a way because they have to be more technically adept than they used to be. But that's just life. That's just what's happened. That's the reality. Tony is a hands-on creative director, designer, and leader at Spin. He also finds time to work on self-started initiatives, most prominent being the publishing venture Unit Editions. At the same time, the work that he stands behind is executed at the highest level. It's relevant, impactful, and beautiful. I find that to be something to look up to, so I was interested in hearing about the work behind it, particularly on how Spin operates as a studio, Tony's role, and his work routines. This is a process that's developed over time, right? So it's not just we start off in this hand. It's yeah. developed over time. On Monday, we have a planning meeting. We all sit around together and we talk about all the things that we did the previous week and all the things that we need to get done in this week. And also if we have deadlines and if we have meetings so that there's some structure to the week. Now, structure creates impetus, creates momentum. If you know that you've got something to do for Wednesday, you get it done for Wednesday. So I'm very keen on, it's going to sound a bit odd, but I don't like the idea of working late or working weekends because I think they give an excuse for baggy behavior, baggy thought, not being focused and not being intense because intensity is the thing. So structure even the loose structure as we have, it creates a certain amount of intensity and a certain amount of, of momentum yeah. because of the way that we do things. The weird thing is I'm saying I don't like the idea of working weekends, I don't like the idea of working late, but I never stop thinking about projects, about solutions, about, about ideas. So I never really switch off. I can't say that that's a good thing or a bad thing. It's just how I am. Yeah. But... I like the idea that we're working within these parameters and that we work hard within these parameters. And if we're having to work later, if we're having to work weekend, it's because we're just under such stress that we don't have any choice. And that other than that, you can have a life. I've worked at places where people, we finish at six o'clock, that the people will just be hanging around till seven, eight o'clock, just hanging around and just to look like they're working late. No, go home. Go have a life. It's, that's not good. I prefer you to be intense and focused in the time that you're here. So we have our Monday morning meeting. Then we, we have like more detailed meetings. Usually Monday, Tuesday, we'll have more detailed meetings on what our solutions might be. We tend to stand around and have a board in the corner of the studio and uh, I'll draw pictures on that and other people will draw pictures on that. There's look like uh, crazy scribbles now, but at the time they made sense. And we talk about the creative solutions that we're going to explore and the, the themes that we're going to explore and the things that we're going to try and do. And then we all get down and do it. And we all, we all work on different projects. So it can be that during the week, a lot of development work happens and we don't all know what's going on, even though we're small, even though there's only three of us essentially to the creatives we don't know what's going on so on friday evening we have a creative review okay four o'clock beers come out each of us show what we've been up to for the week now we share it with 
the rest of the studio. So Trish and, and Edie, who look after the running of the studio and the client liaison and, and all that stuff. And the intern, we all get together, all of us, and we go through the work that we've created for that week and we show what we've been doing. And that way, we all feel connected to everything that's, that's going on and we all know it's, what's happening and we all feel the love, you know, feel the vibes. Yeah. So that's a really good thing to do. So these, these are little formal moments within the week that really help to keep us focused and keep us intense and keep us moving. I think that a design studio should be, well, ours certainly is. I see it very much like um, a Michelin-starred restaurant. That's the vision I've got for the spin. Like we're creating special bespoke responses to people that come in with certain dietary needs for them, you know, <laughs> and we want to create something that surprises them, that they're going to love, that this is going to be amazing, that's better than they could have done themselves. It's really important. And that's create something special and effective. So we've got huge ambitions for the, for the projects that we undertake. And I think that that's the key to longevity, really. Yeah. And then between Monday and Friday, yeah. how are your like days organized? Because I mean, you're also, I assume, have to also do like a more like a management role in some ways, or like a leadership role. How do you balance that, or how much do you actually like create and design versus lead or direct? I do well. You know, it's a very flat thing here. There's three of us: myself. Claudia and Jonathan, we all work together. We all can take leadership of at different points in different projects. Mm -hmm. And we do tend to do that or take responsibility for different things in different projects. So we're all working on projects all of the time, pretty much. The organization of a project and what needs to be done at any given time is a really key part of delivering a project. It's tricky to talk about, not because it's sensitive, it's just complicated. There are a lot of different moving parts in any project. And um, we have a really great open dialogue about what we're doing. So at any given time, we can talk about what should be a priority, what's just become a priority. It's a very fluid kind of situation. Mm -hmm. But it's important that you ride those waves and that you keep on top of things and that you keep talking and so say, for instance, this week, we had the week all planned out. We knew exactly what we needed to do. Mm -hmm. And then a client rings up on Monday and says, so they've got an urgent requirement that has to be delivered on Tuesday and Wednesday. So that knocks out two of us yeah. for the first two days when, when we got all of this stuff planned. So therefore, Claudia and Jonathan have ended up working on that stuff. And I've ended up doing all the other things that we were going to do at the time. So, so therefore I have to be more concentrated and, and more focused and, but we, we managed it and you, we nearly always do it. It's very rare that things become out of hand or problematic because we've got a fairly intense and rigorous working approach. So it doesn't tend to get too messy or too out of hand. Yeah. I think we're all professional enough to know that what's required If someone gives us a project and it's got half a day to deliver some, just now not often, but if they have, yeah. then the best way to approach that is to not get stressed out and run around waving your hands in the air, but to sit down, look at it calmly, work out what needs to be done when, break it down, and then start to deliver it. And that's essentially what we do. And the studio is not big, but I assume you still need... And I mean, it sounds like you do have like quite a good structure. I'm curious, kind of like day to day, how are you organizing yourselves? Do you have like some kind of like a project management system or how do you like navigate that? So in terms of communication, the easiest or most understandable way of thing to talk about really is, is unit additions because that has a very structured requirement. So we're making, we're designing a book. Mm -hmm. We need to get a specification for a printer. So we will give, Claudia and I generally will we'll sit down and we'll work out what the print spec needs to be, the physical nature of the book, the papers, the blah, blah, blah. We'll write all that down. We'll give that to Edie and Trish. One of them, they'll ask us what printers we prefer or are interested in. Mm -hmm. 
they'll ask them for um, a costing and a dummy. So we don't have to think about that after. Once we've done a spec, it goes away from us yeah. and it's ongoing. And in two weeks' time, we'll get dummies back and we'll have a look at them. Yeah. Then there's a lot of management of different aspects of editorial work and content. So say, for instance, we're working on a huge book at the moment that requires a lot of content from the subjects. So ED takes responsibility for that and she will you know, ask them request content and I'll do a certain amount of it if I need to. But I know it's in good hands with Edie. She's looking after it. She takes in the, the content and puts it in the right place so that when we're designing the book, the content is in the right place and uh, yeah. we know what we're doing with it. And then there's there'd be the client liaison. It tends to be through Trish, not always, but a lot of it's through Trish. And she will deal with those conversations, especially conversations about money and budgets and structure, delivery structure and whatever. She she takes care of all that. So the sort of delineation of roles is quite clear. And everything, the whole structure is about about allowing us to deliver the best designs that we can in the best way that we can. Because there's always a physical element. As I say, there's always a digital element. So that's one thing, but there's always a physical element too. And... And they both represent fantastic opportunities. And the massive part of being a designer is taking advantage of those opportunities. So the physical is easier to imagine, you know, but if you get the right texture, the right paper stock, the right color, the right feel, yeah. the right finish, it, may, it adds an awful lot to the design that you're making and to the end result and how people feel about it. So yeah. they're there to support us in achieving that. Spin's journey is wonderfully documented in their 2015 book, Spin 360. That 520-page monograph looks in mouth-watering detail at every aspect of Spin's work and includes texts by Paul Asher, Rick Poynor, Stefan Zagmeister, Wim Crowell and Stephen Heller. As the book's description suggests, it is the studio monograph reborn for the 21st century. Honest, revealing and bursting with specially designed and art-directed content. It's a guide to survival, growth, and maintaining creative excellence over 20 years, making it essential reading for anyone who wants to take a deep dive into a thriving creative studio. Here, I want you to get a first-hand insight into some of the main challenges Tony experienced on his professional journey to date. Here's what he shared with me. Well, there, there's one thing that is going to sound really basic, uh, but it's is very true, and it takes people a long time sometimes to to get a handle on, is that you can, and it took me a while to get a hold of, when you have your own studio, well, actually, no, just in your life, generally, you can make decisions. And making decisions is something that takes a little time to get used to. So when we first set up, I had um, quite a clear ambition again. I'd read that most studios go out of business in the first year, Mm -hmm. and most businesses go vast majority of businesses go out of business in the second year. So businesses very rarely last for more than two years. Yeah. So that was a challenge. And I was determined that we were going to survive two years. So if you imagine that for two years, I would do anything, anything, everything that was thrown at me, I would do and gladly. Yeah. Uh, you're great, grateful to get whatever we got and I'd try and make the best job I could. And I took one weekend off in two years because I was so anxious about you know, not going out of business and, and keeping it on the road. And I just didn't take any time off, which is not a good idea. I'm not saying that's a good thing in any way, shape or form. It's not a good thing. But I think I was a nervous wreck after, after that. And I got a very specific memory of my brain, a picture of my brain being like plasticine. There was nothing left in it. It was just a lump of mushy gray dough. <laughs> and I thought, well, this can't be right. So we, after trundling on for, th- I think, about three years, I decided that we needed to make some changes. We needed to, I had something inside me that wanted more than we were doing and to be better than we were doing. And I more ambition for the design for side of things. And have you, it's, I like, like it's all well and good just making a living, but in the end that isn't enough in, you know. Yeah. He's got more than survival. And so we resigned 
about three or four clients on Christmas. I still can't believe we did that, but <laughs> they were making us desperately unhappy and they weren't, it wasn't the work that I wanted to do. And we accidentally hit upon the idea of making, or I, I did, of making the kind of work that I wanted to be commissioned for. Mm -hmm. And it worked. So we started to make experimental bits and pieces, self-initiated projects. And from that, started getting the kind of projects that we wanted to do. So the idea of being so frightened, so anxious about just existing, that you can't actually make anything that you think is good or worthwhile, it's quite sad, really. That's, that's, it's not, not a great place to be. Yeah. And so I'd like to say that it was brave, but I don't think it really was brave. I think it was actually a necessity. We ne I needed yeah. to do it. So it kind of came to the point where it was like, okay, something needs to change. Yeah, and I changed it. And we knew that it was scary. We knew that it wasn't an obvious thing to do, but, yeah. but it had to be done. And I think that that, so if you imagine we were quite small at that point, yeah. then later on we grew and there were, we were 35 people or something like that. And that has its own problems. And I would go into work and I would look out the window at the road and the traffic going past the road. And I would think, how the hell did I end up here? What is this? <laughs> I mean, we were, doing, we were doing some very, very good work, but we turned into something that I just didn't understand. I wanted a design studio, not some kind of... I was managing it all the time, managing things all the time and spending very little time designing. And so, again, we made a decision. We made a decision once. We could make a decision again. I could say, I could make a decision and say, this isn't how I want things to be. And so we decided to move and become smaller. So we went from 35 to, to 12. It was very stressful. Yeah, I can imagine. You know, I actually lost my voice at one point. It was really, really stressful. But it was the right thing to do. I wanted to be a design studio. And so then after how many years, Again, I felt like I needed a change. We needed a change. We, I wanted to be, I wanted to push things further. I wanted to find out how far could we go and how good could our work be and how exciting could we make it and how interesting could we make our lives as designers mm -hmm. and uh, what potential have we got? We used to have this notion of the scary room. And a scary room is the place where you go into and you're not sure about where you are or what you're doing in there. And you make things that you feel uncomfortable about. You know, the opposite of the scary room is the lazy room, where you don't really think, have to think too much. Yeah. But in a scary room, it's like, what am I doing here? Where, where am I? And, you know, spending more time in the scary room, making things that uh, you're not sure about or you're, you're trying things out. And I wanted to spend more time in the scary room and experimenting and making things that were unexpected and that were, were interesting. And I also feel that we... I mean, I shouldn't really say this, but I, I feel that design studios in the UK and maybe maybe in other places too, they tend to, to be quite conservative and adventurous places. And that's kind of sad. Design studios should be leading. They should be part of a, an avant-garde of creativity. And they, so yes, there are always commercial projects and I love doing commercial projects, but also by the same token, there's room for pushing boundaries and making different things and being surprising too, yeah, you know. Yeah. So I enjoy commercial projects as much as the next designer. But I also think it's really important for us to be testing those boundaries. And it's amazing how often clients want the stuff where you are pushing a boundary or where you are doing something fresh and interesting. Yeah. So I think it's... Um, Really, I mean, big clients are coming to us and saying, oh, I see that thing you did and that, that experimental thing. I'd love you to follow that and try more of that. It's fantastic. So yeah, I think it's always paid off that kind of inventive spirit and that expressive spirit has always paid off. Yeah. Uh, whereas I started very much on a conservative kind of scared trajectory, like just want to keep my job and be paid, to taking a leap of faith and, and flying. Yeah. There's always enough downtime in a, in a design studio to make stuff, to start exploring things. 
there's always some downtime in, his, in a studio. Yeah. And I mean, like, during those more challenging, like, periods when you had to make those difficult decisions, how do you, like, personally go, go about it? Was it just like you kind of came to a place which was, let's say, that bad that you were like, okay, I need to, like, be more, like, reflective and see what to do? Or, like, or is it just, like, something that you're continually doing? How would you, like, approach that? I think it's difficult to get distance from things that sometimes... Yeah. Uh, but there are, if you don't feel that something is going well or something needs to change, or first of all, you've got to have that little niggly feeling in the back of your mind that something needs to change or something needs to be looked at or thought about. Yeah. I tend to carry that around with me for a long time and, and it's difficult to get distance. A couple of things I've started to do, which designers are good at anyway, which is making lists. Mm -hmm. And lists give you some a kind of an itemized cut down version of whatever the problems might be. And then diagrams as well, very graphic design solutions. You know, so start, start, start doing diagrams of where you are and what you like and what you don't like and what you think isn't working and what the problem is. And it's funny because we've been going through this recently and it's exactly, exactly what we did was make lists, make diagrams, and you start to get a picture of actually yeah, an emotional psychological picture through the making of lists and diagrams yeah. of what you want, where you want to be, how you want to do things, what your ambition is. Sometimes it's very, very hard to figure out what the hell you want and um, what is good and what's not so good. And the other thing is to, is to take yourself off somewhere and like go for a weekend somewhere with the express purpose of giving yourself a little bit of distance and thinking about these things. And I think that's been very useful as well. That's a good device. If you take a, a sketch pad and a pen and go to a, just go somewhere else and just give yourself a little bit of distance. It's a distance that's difficult because you're so caught up quite often in the day-to-day -day complexities of things that you, to find some clarity and distance is very difficult. Hey friends, you're listening to the Creative Voyage podcast. We're in the middle of this episode, so it's time for a short break. If you like this podcast, I'm confident you're going to enjoy the Creative Voyage Monthly Edit, a newsletter for which every month I ask a different creative professional to curate 10 brief recommendations of cool things to inform and inspire, including books, articles, products, portfolios, podcasts, and more, and deliver it exclusively to your inbox. It's a newsletter curated by creatives for creatives. To sign up, visit creative.voyage slash newsletter. Thanks, everyone. Let's get back to the show. Here's a paragraph from the About section on Spin's website. Quote, Graphic design is our passion. We are obsessed by the challenges of a discipline that exists in a state of constant flux. At its best, it is thought-provoking, memorable, and leaves a lasting impression. End quote. I've asked Tony to discuss what he thinks are some of those challenges both for the industry at large and for him personally, today and in the near future. See, if you imagine when I was coming through, things were utterly compartmentalized. A graphic designer's job was mainly to do layout. Yeah. A typographer's job was mainly to design typefaces. An animator's job was to animate typography. A graphic designer's job was not to put the typography in, that was the job of someone else. That was a typesetter. Typesetter, you tell the typesetter what type you wanted, they would play it in. And there would be a whole team of people. Now all of those things, all of those walls, all of those divisions have evaporated. And a graphic designer can do the animation, can do the layout, can do the typesetting, can do the, the type, can design a typeface. So yeah. I suppose it's never been easier and never been harder to be a graphic designer at either end. Your grandma can design her own letterhead on a thing and she can do what she wants. That's, I actually think that's great because it gives them some notion of how skillful graphic designers are. It's like when you, if you play football and you're, you're a bit shit at it and then you see Messi or, or you see Ronaldo, you think, wow, you, get, you have some appreciation yeah. you know, because you're so terrible at it that, that they're, how good they are at it or Leonardo and drawing or whatever it might be. Yeah. But I'm not saying that graphic design is Leonardo, but there's some skill involved, basically. Yeah. yeah. But to be a graphic designer today, you have to have a huge range of skills 
And so in many ways, it's much more demanding than it was a long time ago. I mean, you only have to think of one small section, one small, small part of things. Yeah. And it might be that it returns to a degree to that where it becomes more compartmentalized again and more specifically focused. But at the moment, all these barriers have all dissolved and it's all in one area. So I'd, I'd say for me, the difficulty in being a student now and being a young professional now, sheer range of possibilities to try and control those possibilities and try and focus yourself on certain aspects and learn your, your graphic voice and your approach and to be at a, a professional quality in all those areas is quite a challenge. So that's quite a hurdle. And do you like foresee or ever think about like, so there's like, you're in a current position currently, do you think like, okay, kind of what's going to happen in like five, 10, 20 years, let's say, what could be challenges for for spin or automation actually that's a chance for then it's a graphic design generally but automation of processes is something that i'm just interested to see how that goes because machines could do layouts yeah so i'd be interested to see how that goes i don't know how many graphic designers you need in the world in fact we were talking yesterday saying i don't know i don't know what happens to them all because uh in each year, thousands and thousands of designers graduate from college in all, all countries all around the world. Where do they go? So I'm curious about that. As far as spin's concerned, we have a lot of things that we want to explore and, and start to look at. I'm, I'm really interested in the idea of making things, making objects, making, and, and I'm not sure what those things are. But I've noticed that Applying graphics to things, and often not very nice graphics to things, seems to be something that's, that happens. So it could be fashion, it could be in the home, but the people that are doing it tend not to be as good as I think they could be and should be in terms of the design of things. Yeah. So I'm interested in exploring that. And I don't know where that is going to lead. We're trying to work that out. How do we do that? You know, how do we achieve that? What do we make? How do we follow it up? Yeah. So that's kind of interesting. I'd like to think that we keep publishing things. I'd like to think that, as I said, I really enjoy commercial projects. So I'd like to think that we're still going to carry on with those. I love the whole thing of creating an identity, creating a visual language that can be recognizable and held within certain sort of graphic forms is endlessly fascinating and there's huge possibilities the way that we see um, identities is essentially as organic living things. Whereas before, I was saying that in the, this is you know, making a very basic case for it, but in the 50s and 60s, you might have created a, a single mark and you put that mark and you repeat, you repeat it in red on the side of everything. That's it. Well, that's not the way that it is now. That mark or that whole language, that whole visual language can grow and be organic and it can develop and change, and it can change in, in form, and it can change in color, and it can change in movement. And it almost has to, to keep people engaged and keep people. I sometimes talk about graphic design as being a form of entertainment. And it, sometimes it is. If you just simply press a button and repeat, then people are quite within their rights to stop looking at it. Yeah. And then taking a note, so it just not, it, it's not worth any attention. So there are a lot of wonderful possibilities in that, that area, the area of identity creation that uh, is super exciting. During the preparation for this conversation, I've heard the following statement in one of Tony's interviews. Being a designer is about opinion. That sentence intrigued and stuck with me, so I've asked him if he could discuss it further. I think that that comment was really about an idea that was floating around in the 60s, 50s, 60s, 70s of the subjugation of the designer's opinion for the sake of the communication of the client. So that in the, the modernist designers talk about neutralizing their opinion mm -hmm. and it not being about their opinion. It's, it's like a, something where their opinion is removed from the equation and you're just dealing with pure and adulterated fact or information. Now, I just don't believe that. 
you can't actually hide your opinion because your opinion comes through in, like, let's say, a Muller Brockman Music Aviva poster. And that's just typography. Now, he's made a decision through his opinion. He's made a decision that the type should be black and red and where it should be black and red. He's made a decision on the type, the size of the typography, on the kerning of the typography, the position of the typography. All of it, every single moment, even though it's only it's just pure typography and a very supposedly neutral typeface, the sans serif typeface, every single moment of that is full of opinion and full of attitude. Yeah. So neutrality is absolutely just, it's not possible to be neutral, to not have opinion. I understand that somehow they're, they're talking about a desirability for the designer not to be in between conversation between the consumer and the client. But we are. <laughs> I mean, yeah, <laughs> absolutely are. We can't, we can't deny it. And when you admit that to yourself and say, well, it just is, that's just the case, because w- whatever choices I make, their opinion, even if it's Helvetica, then it opens up a whole load of possibilities, creative possibilities. Like I was thinking about this the other day in terms of our opinion, and I just had a moment of um, an epiphany, shall we say. Okay. It was basically that we occupy two kind of opposite positions. One is that we make codified, reductive, neutral, and formalized typography. So structured, legible, modernist-inspired, grid-inspired grid typography. And simultaneously, we make fluid, flamboyant, expressive idiosyncratic, personalized lettering. And I think that that's evolved, that position has evolved over time and become something that's, that we're, we're very interested in exploring. Also, when our perception, it's the stories you tell, the legends that you tell yourself that help you to create. When we create an identity, we talk about creating the seed of an identity. So we're looking for the, the kernel, the seed, the little nut that's at the very center of an identity. And then once we've established that notion of what that is, how does that grow? How does it live? How does it move? How does it evolve? So that gives you a very purposeful and focused and deliberate process to go through. So I think between those two worlds, knowing that, that the structure and function and beauty of typography formally arranged and how effective that could be visually in concert with the freedom and the fluidity of language that, sur- that can surround it and be part of it. But we don't know the answer to the question before we've been asked it. So if you look at the identities that we've created, there's quite a lot of variety in terms of expression and, and approach and what have you. And that's because we ask different questions. Yeah. We're not assuming a certain style or a certain result, end result, that we go through a process of rational thinking that ends up at, at a certain place. But the other thing about rationality is that if you push rationality, you can end up in slightly odd places or slightly irrational looking places which is also really interesting. SPIN has a holistic approach in dealing with clients' complex requirements, which is supported by extensive experience in delivering rigorous visual identity systems across all platforms. In my opinion, they are one of the top studios globally when it comes to brand identity creation. Designing identities is one of my main professional occupations, and SPIN is certainly one of those studios I look up to. So I was thrilled to use this opportunity to ask Tony about how they at SPIN approach the development of a visual identity. When I see a visual identity that I think is successful, every time I see see an expression of that identity, I know who it is. And that can be very minimal or it can be very maximal. It can be very profoundly, have a very profound personality or it can be quite a subtle personality. But you know who's talking to you every time you see that identity you know who it is that's immediately yeah. now that can be very ugly sometimes and, and quite often actually in corporate design world but um 
you know, when you see it done well and, and done beautifully or done with a huge amount of confidence and whatever, it can be really spectacular and really memorable and effective. Yeah. Would you be willing to kind of give us an insight in kind of how you uh, at SPIN approach like creating a visual identity? I'm curious, like if you do have like a specific process that you follow, uh, because often design studios and agencies do have like a formalized certain like steps to creation from more kind of like initial like workshops or discovering what the brand is all about to then kind of design process. There are some things that we always do. We always do some research. We always have conversations. So online research into the area that's surrounding the client. We always have conversations with the client about what they're hoping to achieve. I think that's where the, usually the key comes from. Mm -hmm. That's where the insight comes from. That's where the inspiration, the fire, the little, the little moment tends to come from those conversations. And it can be something that's really incidental that they don't even realize that they've said, but it gives an insight into their ambition and to their hopes for their identity. So there's nearly always, in fact, I think pretty much all of the uh, identities that we've made, the inspiration has come through a conversation with the client and then amongst ourselves. And we can always say, this identity is like this because, and quite often this identity is like this because of you said this, because your position, your thinking inspired it. Now, it's very rare. It's more often that that happens, those real insights happen in conversation than they do through a document. So documentation, what I mean by that is that, you know, people can quite often give you very involved briefs, which are very useful. I'm not saying they're not, they're very useful, but they don't tend to give you that moment of insight for the form of an identity. They tend to be more about what you want to achieve and what you want to do and, and how it's applied and the situation they find themselves in and what have you rather than just a, that core of what the identity needs to be. And I think the core of what the identity needs to be tends to come from conversation. And do you formalize that in some way, like during your process? Like, do you actually, I mean, of course you have like initial meetings and stuff like that, but then do you actually, I don't know, make like client workshops or is it more organic or? We have done, it depends. It depends if it's, if it's required or not. And generally, Well, quite often it's not required. And my experience of them is that if you're forcing someone into a situation that they don't really feel comfortable with, so you're, you're asking someone to tell you their five favorite brand identities and why they're their five favorite brand, and they don't know. They, you know, I like Apple, yeah. and I like, you know, whatever. That's not really that useful. But if there's a real will, on their part or a real desire on their part to want to, to go through those processes, then we absolutely, we have them. We've done through them numerous times. But in the main, the lead from the clients tends to be, we have this company needs an identity and we want to achieve this. We're looking to be on the international stage. We want to create an impact. We want to want people to notice what we're doing, want to elevate what we're doing. And all those words mean something. Yeah. They mean something in terms of an identity. And then they'll give you, like I said, just some little notion, something that can either be very specific or just very lateral, which you have to have your ears open for. I guess that you just get through experience. That just sets you off on a path. But there's always a story for every identity When you've gone through the process of discussion, research, and if there are workshops or whatever, there's always a story to tell about how you ended up or why you ended up there. And it's usually a lovely, short, pithy little story that gets you to the heart of why the identity is the way that it is, or at least the heart of the identity is the way that it is, and then how it expands from, from that point. And do you have like a specific kind of like ratio of, phases in a project that you kind of spend time on, like because there's research, there's development, and there's kind of production and designing. Yes. Like how does that relate usually? The starting point is that we, we create a document based on the document of the client, on the information that we have, that, that goes through a series of staged presentations. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is to 
get it all down and explain the process and explain the, the costs. The next thing to do, so the first stage would usually be meetings, conversations. The second stage would be creative. We always say that we, we will show a number of creative routes. We, we tend to sometimes, occasionally, we'll go with one route because it's so much, it's so strong and so right and so perfect. And that does happen. But more often, you might have two or three routes. One thing I would say to any graphic designer is never show anything that you wouldn't be really happy developing. Yeah, They will choose it. And it's your own fault. You should never have shown it. Yeah, that's good advice. It's one that you probably learn the hard way. So once you start the creative routes, there's a certain amount of development within those routes. I'm just looking at, actually, just as I'm talking, I'm looking at a, a, a page of all of the identities that we've created over the, over the years mm-hmm. and thinking about how many iterations we would show for those identities. And a lot of them have been multiple routes, a lot of them mm-hmm. one or two routes. And that's because we're in really close contact with the client and we're, we're sharing the journey with the client. So that doesn't require hundreds of iterations. I'm not I'm trying to avoid doing hundreds of iterations. It's just that that's not productive if you're in, in genuine conversation with them. Yeah. So I'm looking at, there's one identity here that on, on the sheet I'm looking at where we did, I don't know, lots and lots of iterations and ended up with the most simple mark imaginable. And that's because it's a cultural institution that had a very specific relationships with a certain part of the world. And we, we start to explore visual language based on that part of the world. Mm-hmm. And it's impossible to encapsulate that part of the world or any part of the world with one particular style, graphic style. And so we ended up with a less is more position, which is wholly appropriate for this. It's not, not trying to say everything that you can possibly say is essentially not trying to say anything, but it's kind of a neutral position. But that's an exception. The vast majority of identities have a concept and an idea behind them, and that, that idea has nearly always sprung from a conversation, and so has some root in reality and some root in, in the process. So we go through this process of explanation, then presentation, and then production. So in the presentation, can take some time. There can be some toing and froing and and exploring different things. And then you move on to production. So it's three stages. Yeah. And then during the that like creative part, you said like you're in conversation with a client, but does that mean like as soon as you kinda have that one or two ideas which are you're kinda happy with, yeah. do you like immediately kind of share them or show like hints of it? Or do you actually keep it more closed off and develop it a bit more and, and kind of show how it can work and then share it? Like how do you is it like a more open process or more you kinda go shut off your doors for a bit and kind of develop it fully, quote unquote? What's really important is that I suppose this comes through from experience to some degree, is you have to explain your idea coherently and reasonably fully so that the person you're explaining it to can understand it. When you're inhabiting this kind of world, I say inhabiting in the sense of like it's with you all the time, you're thinking about this all the time, you're thinking about this identity all the time, you can be mistaken for thinking that the client is in the same place that you are and they're not. Yeah. It's you. You're spending hours and hours considering, thinking, wandering around, having a shower, brushing your teeth, sleeping. Yeah. And thinking about this identity, and yeah. and they're not, and so you've got to take them along the journey that they've inspired in you, but you've got to take them along this journey and explain, and you know, take it step by step, and so again, finding a little distance between yourself and the project, so you can say, does this make sense? I have a picture which is in my mind, which is, have you walked through the jungle and then ended up in a lovely clearing? And the client can then say, oh, yeah, I see how we got here. This makes perfect sense. Yeah. Or just helicopter them into the clearing. So there you go. So you need, you don't just want to, you need to take them through the journey with you a little bit enough. Not, not so much so they're bored stupid with it, but 
enough that they get what you're driving at and what the potential of this thing is. So that requires quite a lot of development sometimes. But it's lovely if it's coming from a real place and a place that they're connected with. I think that's really important that they feel connected with it. And you can show the benefit of it and show where it works. And you don't need to do more than that, but you need to do that. And how long does the process like usually last? Let's say if you have like a, there's no like specific requirement from a client. They're like, okay, we need a brand. Give us your proposal. How much time it takes to let from that like first step to kind of developing something for like a medium sized company? I mean, it's not always possible, but I'd say that you like to have it running around in your mind for a while, for two or three weeks of just, you know, knowing about it, knowing that you're going to do it and just having it running around in your subconscious. And then um, after that, six weeks of development, something like that. And then the, a little bit of to and fro afterwards, it shouldn't be too long. But yeah, I think it can, if things go on for months and months without any real progress, then that starts to be a problem. The client starts losing interest and you, you start losing interest a little bit. So it's important in the first instance that you have some time to think about things, even if it's a week or two weeks. Yeah. You have some time to just let it run around your head. And then when you get down to it and start making, that process isn't so long that you start adding things just for the sake of it. So, yeah. so if, that's, if that's four to six weeks, that's great. Yeah. And then after that, hopefully you get a positive response. I'm thinking of a job we're doing now. We get a positive response. And so then we're dealing with a load of practical issues and there'll be stages within that. So, for instance, there's a corporate site to be dealt with. There's a, the website to be dealt with. There are some commercial things, some commercial aspects to be dealt with. But there are, these are all different things that, all, that require different deliverables. They require a lot of investigation in terms of production of, the, of say, items that, for marketing and items for print and items for all different kinds of things. So there are still aspects of the, the job which are unresolved, but the main thrust of the job that have still been creatively developed as you, as you go through these things. But the main thrust of the job has been agreed and you, everybody knows they're on the right, the right direction. In 2009, Tony Brook, together with Patricia Finnegan and Adrian Shaughnessy, formed Unit Editions. It's an independent publishing venture, producing books for international audience of designers, design students and followers of visual culture. Since then, Unit Edition published a series of beautifully produced essential publications, including What is Universal Everything, Paula Share Works, Manuals 1 and 2, and Studio Culture, to name a few personal favorites. At the time of our conversation, it was their 10th anniversary, which is no small feat for an independent publisher. So I've asked Tony to introduce us to Unit Editions and what we could expect in their next decade. Unit Editions is a very, very small thing. It's like a cottage industry. Okay. Well, we, well cottage industry. It's, it's, it's a, we used to take bags of books down to the post office, carry them down literally ourselves, for the first five years, but we don't do that now. We have someone who, who so that's one improvement. So we go, the reason we do the Kickstarters is because we don't have big finance behind us, we don't have any finance behind us. And we only can exist through the support of designers and people who are, who are into design, into visual culture. So if it weren't for the, the Kickstarter or the social media funded, shall I say, then we wouldn't be able to do it really. And it's, it's ironic that we're making books in the age of the internet. And the reason we can make the books is because we're in the age of the internet. <laughs> so it was, it was supposed to kill print, but instead it's done the exact opposite. It's allowed us to, to survive and to thrive. So there are so many wonderful stories within design. I can only speak for myself. If you go back to the time when we were just setting up, I just finished working on a a project for a commercial publisher. And I thought there were so many things wrong with that process. It wasn't by designers. It wasn't run by people who really got design, I didn't feel. So the, the paper stocks weren't that important. Some of the content wasn't as good as it should be, you know, etc. 
And I thought a lot of publishing was making uh, kind of dumb books, and that I thought that there was much, much richer stories to be told about graphic design. And I love the idea that, we say architecture or any of the arts, really, that graphic designers make these wonderful books for them, beautiful books, but weren't doing it for themselves. Yeah. So the notion of, of a graphic design, a publisher majoring on graphic design and typography, that was telling these stories in a meaningful way and giving them the books that I thought they deserved seemed to be an exciting prospect. So in those terms, the future is going to be making more rich, interesting books, hopefully through crowdfunding. It's financially, it's not, I don't make any money out of it. So it's very much a love thing. But I do think that that some of the books that we're making are having people value, and that's really important to me, that people value the books that, that we're making. So we're planning our next Kickstarter thing, which might be a spin project, actually, that we're working on. But it would take me an hour to explain, unfortunately. <laughs> but, then, uh, but we're just doing the Designers Republic book. The plan is that that's finished in the next couple of months, so that goes to print. And we've got a series of titles lined up. They're going to be really good. You know, we started off talking about young designers and what they should be doing and what they could be doing. I think one of the things that graphic design as a subject should do, or what it requires is for its practitioners to really love it and to be really involved in it and, and to know more about it. If Unit Editions was, was about anything for me, then that was probably it. That, uh, you know, we've got this fascinating, amazing and interesting history. And that more of us ought to know more about it and be proud of it and realize that we're in this we're in this fantastic lineage of of wonderful creatives and brilliant work and be proud of it and know about it and add to it. Yeah. Rather than just turning up and laying out type every day, you know, that we're we actually feel like we're we're part of something that's worthwhile. I mean I think you've been doing yeah a great job. Oh, thanks. I'm always excited to see what's coming next and and books are like, yeah, they're beautiful <laughs> in short. Yeah, well, thank you. That's really great to hear. I think that um, it's not easy. Books take so much effort and time to make. And I can't tell you how, how much I appreciate your words. That <laughs> really, that's so cool to hear. We've come to the last topic I've discussed with Tony. And as with other guests, I've asked him to leave us with vital advice and insights based on what he experienced so far on his professional journey. If you're feeling comfortable, then be concerned. To be a creative, you need to feel alive. You need to feel connected. You need to feel really alive, really aware. And you need to be absorbing everything and not using it all, but just absorbing everything and having an open mind. I think that designers are or have the potential to be a wonderful positive force in the world and a real force for good. And if we can remind ourselves of that every now and again, and also that beauty is important. Now, beauty isn't always obvious. I think if you're too comfortable creating your beauty, then that is also a problem. Beauty can be slightly uncomfortable. Beauty can be a little odd and a little weird. And so beauty isn't necessarily lazy. It can be unusual. It's our duty or our, our reason to be here is to sometimes bring that out. And so I love the idea of designers, you know, just insisting on being innovators and being creators and surprising people. And if you imagine that you're conducting a conversation and you're a designer and you're conducting a conversation with an audience, you have an audience, as a designer, you should never have a boring conversation with your audience. There's no excuse for you to be boring, for you to have a, a dull, thoughtless conversation. Whatever the, the subject is, you could be working on financial reports, you could be working on artist posters, you could be working on anything at all. And all of it can be designed well, it can be designed beautifully and interestingly and surprisingly 
And it's our duty to try and make that happen, whatever the question. Yeah, amazing. I mean, I still feel that it's easy to be conservative and to to have recipes as a graphic designer. You can have certain things that you think are are very tasteful and, and polite, and there are basically structures that you rely on. And it's very easy for us to do that. If you range Helvetica left, then you can't go too far wrong, right? So I have nothing against Helvetica, but I have against lazy thinking. And I think that uh, we just have to try and be demanding of ourselves and remind ourselves every now and again that we need to shake ourselves up out of our... Yeah. The enemy of design is complacency, essentially. There's nothing wrong with celebrating good design or design that's exciting us or making something and being excited by it. But the next day, same again. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's not good enough to... Because it is a subject in which you can just coast through it and you can coast through your career and never, never make anything that's of real interest. And whatever we say, we all have these opportunities. One of the big qualities that I think designers need is relentlessness, not giving up. You know, yeah, there's sometimes you're going to have a client who's not going your way, but don't lie down. Try and keep it as good as it can be, even if it's not going your way. Yeah. And, and the next day, get up and do it again and try again. And I think that the key to longevity is not giving up, <laughs> you know. It's, <laughs> it's um, keeping that optimism. It's, it's easy to say, and it's a very tough thing to keep, but just try and remain optimistic and keep creating things that you, you think are worthwhile. Hey, everyone. That's it for this episode. I hope you find it useful, and if you like this podcast, tell a friend. I want to thank Tony for coming onto the show. I've been obsessed by his work since my university days, so it was a pleasure to meet him and have this conversation. I'm grateful for his time and all the insights he shared. Links to Tony's work, as well as to some other things mentioned during the conversation, can be found in the show notes at creative.voyage slash podcast. Also, you can follow at creative.voyage on Instagram, join the monthly edit newsletter at creative.voyage slash newsletter, and if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe. Until next time, my friends, take care.